Sí. 
I start with that song that speaks of the stolen land in South Africa. We the Africans, we the black people, we cry for our land. Our land that was stolen. Can they leave our land alone? Can they leave our land alone? Where do I come from? I come from a country where on the 31st of May in 2021, learners and their parents protested on the premises of one of the private schools in Pretoria because of the racism experienced by black children at the school. One of the learners addressed the school saying that her first and most vivid memory of racism happened when she was in grade four. She would have been around nine or 10 years old. She says, I was happily on my way to break when a teacher stopped me she looked me dead in the eyes and said, your hair is unpresentable. It is messy and it's not the Cornwall way. She also proceeded to tell me that I'd look better if I chemically treated my hair. After that encounter, I believed there was something wrong with my natural kinky hair and for a long time, I was uncomfortable wearing my natural hair to school. I repeat, she was nine years old. It is in such moments where we are painfully reminded that the processes of decolonization, Africanization, are necessary as coloniality continues to rear its head in the classrooms, during school breaks, always reminding us of the audacity of whiteness as it pierces through people's sense of being in the world. I go back in time a little bit to 2007, where black women or black workers at the University of the Free State were made to drink urine by white students. Some of those workers could have been my mother, my aunt, my uncle, my father. Fast forward in 2022, there's something about uh, urination and white students on campuses, clearly. In 2022, a white student walked into the university's residential room of a black student at Stellenbosch University and he urinated on the black students' belongings. These acts get repeated because they often happen with impunity. This happens because black bodies are deemed as bodies that do not belong. Perceived as subhuman, we are continuously treated as what Franz Fanon refers to as the wretched of the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand here in acknowledgement of how many of our universities 
that most of us, if not all of us in this room, are affiliated with, how these universities are directly implicated when it comes to land issues. We know that we cannot begin to speak about justice or healing without confronting the injustices that stare at us in the very university spaces that we inhabit. I therefore would like to pay my respect with humility to the First Nations people, the Aboriginal people of this land, the ancestors who remain restless, I believe, because of the injustices that continue. And to declare that this lecture today is dedicated to their memories. I do not stand here alone. I carry those who came before me. They continue to guide me and I honor them. I've always been preoccupied with and interested in issues of identity and belonging. Identity in the broad sense, but with particular attention to gender identity, place identity and belonging. My research interest has been on the impact of displacement, of dispossession and being disenfranchised because it is at these intersections and multi-dimensions that I pay attention to the everydayness of trauma and human suffering. I've spent a long time focusing on the woundedness of women who have to love in fear in a world that renders them illegitimate beings whose place in the world is always in question. One just needs to look at the statistics, for example, of gender-based violence. We know it's not personal or individual, but systemic as well. My research journey engages research questions and preoccupations that started when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Pretoria, one of the formerly white only university. There I was confronted with race and racism and the politics of identity and non-belonging. It was in the everyday interactions, the encounters with the physical structures, the buildings at the universities and confrontation with the physical hostility that I became sorely aware of my blackness and what it represents. I come from a community where I was loved, where I was just human, where I was a member of a family, a member of a community, and then I walked into a university space that told me that I am black and my blackness is a problem. There I became solely aware of my blackness and what it represents within these spaces. And here I align myself with W.E.B. Du Bois and his pertinent question, how does it feel to be a problem? The everydayness of being a problem was in the mundane. When someone refused to sit next to you, in a bus, when you see blunt segregation in the dining halls, when announcements were made only in Afrikaans, assuming that we all understood Afrikaans. It was in these moments of encounters that I critically reflected on the importance of racial justice and epistemic justice. The very idea of what it means to belong and what it means to be an outsider. And here I echo Swanton, who argues that race takes form in multiple contingent and devious ways, and it gives shape to encounters. So I grappled with these complex and alienating encounters from my undergraduate studies all the way to my master's, where I examined the politics of place identity. 
having to navigate with being what Jasper Poor calls bodies out of place and what Hugo Canem calls reviled bodies where you are constantly reminded that you do not belong or you do not represent what the place stands for. Yesterday when we had conversations um, here at the university at one of the other campuses, um, one of the sisters, Ruth, spoke about this idea of being an imposter. So what your body as a black person, what your body as a black woman represents. And when you walk within these places and being made to feel as if you do not belong, so this constant feeling of being an imposter in a place that did not have you in mind when it was established or developed, and now you walk into this space and you need to find yourself, you need to find your reflection within this space, but oftentimes we don't. So I became preoccupied with engaging the importance of what it means to be treated with dignity, where each person's humanity is represented. Kimberly Crenshaw offered me the vocabulary here to think about how struggles are not the same and how important it is to take seriously the intersectionality of people's lives. According to Crenshaw, intersectionality is an analytical sensibility, a way of thinking about identity and its relationship to power. And then Jasper Poor moves beyond the intersections and introduces what she calls assemblages, where our bodies are in a constant state of becoming and therefore cannot be restricted to rigid labeling or even categorizing. And here I think of my discipline psychology and um, this idea of wanting to categorize because we can only make meaning or make sense if we categorize. Of course, this idea of becoming is in line also with the African worldview and its notion of personhood as always becoming. So how do I, how do we become with distorted histories? When we are racially marked, when our cultures are seen as backward, how do we imagine gender justice in the midst of this erasure? So it is with these questions that I shift my attention to the meaning of gendered struggles. And I hope to use the rest of this lecture to focus on a few things. The everydayness of gendered trauma, the languaging or vocabulary of trauma, how we understand trauma and how we make meaning of trauma, and how, as I do in my work, we can draw from visual methodologies to speak the unspeakable, and finally, how I see these visual methods as decolonial, liberatory, and healing practices. Women's stories have and continue to be written in the visible, but also the invisible parts of their bodies. Stories of shame, stories of anger, stories of joy and desire, and these are often not told and not given space because we, we, we are seen only from a point of deficit, of lack, of deficiency, assuming that we don't experience joy or we don't have desires. So stories of pain, oppression, resistance, but also survival. <laughs> I was raised by such women a community that comprised of women who lived through various oppressive regimes, colonialism, apartheid in South Africa, but with all that still managed to build families and communities amidst the storms of these oppressive regimes. Many South African women have and continue to be rendered mute. Their bodies are deemed disposable 
and their very existence is under constant surveillance. Many have stood up and loudly challenged and negated this assumption of helplessness and voicelessness. Many are in the public eye. Many are our mothers, our aunts, our everyday women in the village, in our communities, with narratives that have been penned by themselves and others on their behalf. So I draw inspiration from many such women in their works, they grapple with the ways in which South African black women navigated the oppressive apartheid systems through actions such as refusing to carry the bus laws, survived forced removals, and managed to create homes in the middle of impossible living conditions and movement restrictions. Through their works, through their stories, these women offer voice and space for women to speak back, to reflect, and to challenge the often skewed master narratives that focus on equality and gender justice. Through such feminist imaginations and imaginings, I look at mapped bodies. I see women as mapped bodies that continue to be butchered constantly figuratively, literally. And so I try through my work to call for the imagining of a different existence, a different reality. I grapple with pol political vernaculars of freedom, of love, of loss, and of mourning. In many ways, we experience perpetual mourning because of the persistent injustices that continue to confront us daily. I do this because there continues to be stories that many people who have experienced traumatic and oppressive pasts carry with them, stories that continue to remain untold. It is important to interrogate and to revisit experiences of the past, offer them space to be told and retold in the journey to meaning making. Gordon points out in her book that we need to consider what she calls the alternative diagnostics, which will give us space to rethink master narratives and consider what has been excluded from these master narratives. It is these alternative diagnostics that I'm interested in as I attempt to look at ways in which the private memories and lived experiences of women who lived through apartheid in South Africa can be given space to be heard. This is where my work begins. But my work is nestled between psychology and women's studies. And so I start by challenging my own home discipline of psychology. I ask this broad question, how might we engage psychology scholarship, its theories, and even its practice differently, now that we know and cannot deny the steady stream of racialized and gendered violence that confront us on a daily basis, the violence that reverberate under the soles of our feet? How do we theorize pain? How do we theorize social injustice and collective suffering. I'm interested in the critical project of decolonizing knowledges, which involves contesting what liberation psychologist Ignacio Martin Barro calls the collective lies that continue to be told about people, their histories and their lived experiences. Our histories, our lived experiences. Martin Barrault argues that if human beings are products of history, then clearly that particular history will have repercussions on the mental health of people. He goes on to argue that this impact will be referred to as the psychosocial trauma. And it is this psychosocial trauma that I place my work on, how we carry the wounds of colonialism, of apartheid, 
of government states that do not people that do not put people's wellness at the center of their agenda i'm specifically interested in how all these wounds often invisible show themselves in the ways in which women navigate the world where they are perpetually confronted by social and psychical trauma my work engages therefore social suffering and trauma at the intersection of both the individual and the collective this means doing research focusing on gender on community well-being on place identity and on belonging all of them together understanding that they they are interconnected i was drawn to psychology because of the opportunity i believe it offers to think about our relationship to one another and how we can understand wellness in relation to how we engage in and with the world the bigger question that i grapple with is how can psychology assist us in the ways in which we contemplate and approach societal challenges and issues of well-being to think about how psychology responds to societal challenges and well-being requires us to first start by taking a step back and reflect on how psychology as a discipline in its theorization and its practice has normalized the framing of certain subjects often white subjects as the norm right and other subjects other beings often black as a problem so when we think about the vulnerable population who comes to mind when we think about the those who are perceived to be helpless needing help who do we think about so therefore who is perceived as the problem and often within psychology the framing of the research question the framing of what studies we need to do how way focusing on who the gaze is where the guilt comes in and it's where the, this perpetuation of who is the problem then continues so we cannot do the work without first starting by challenging the very disciplines that we find ourselves in this problematic framing was legitimized by how skewed our research endeavors and theorizations were and i argue in many ways continue to be this framing contributes to the politics of belonging and its parameters of insider outsider politics the discipline itself has over a long period of time cultivated alienation of some subjects that come into the discipline how do i see myself in the ways in which theories are explained how do i see myself in the ways in which psychology defines and categorizes what is normal and what is not often where i stand and where i come from is often where the abnormal is situated but for me coming from south africa it's always it's also important to acknowledge the shameful role that the discipline has played in the development of apartheid of segregation of oppression of people and actively contributed to constructing us as subhuman and deserving of repression so if it's scientific and it has been proven therefore it makes it legitimate and it can be put into law i argue that we need to reflect and engage with this first layer of the discipline before we consider the actual <coughs> disciplinary practice itself we need to engage with and confront the historical ghosts that continue to linger it's important to take the discipline and turn it towards itself because in so doing we lay the ground or foundation for doing truly healing work 
So what psychology aims to do and what it purports to do is not possible if it's theorization, the starting point of its theorization is problematic and based on an oppressive regime or a history that is distorted. I've argued in my earlier work that psychology has for a long time been quick to diagnose victims of traumatic experiences from an individualistic perspective, almost always positioning the problem within the person. It's your issue, it's your problem, you are the one that needs help. So within psychology, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, has become the way to operationalize suffering. And I worry that this has occluded how suffering lives in a body, how it lives in a family, how it lives in a community, how it lives in the ways in which we think our cognitions, our memory, what we remember, how we remember, and embodiments as well. This happens in, in, through voice, in silence, over time as well. When we speak about intergenerational trauma, when we speak about the remnants of what happened during apartheid to the generation that we have today, so therefore we cannot speak about trauma as an individual experience. It's felt in the whole family, in the whole community. So in our thinking, our theorizing, when we look at the possibilities of the work that needs to be done for healing to take place, our standpoint also has to, to shift. Where we start has to be given attention. So the aftershocks that people still experience, the aftershocks of displacement, we continue to speak about issues of land because many of us were displaced. Our ancestral land, our ancestral spaces continue to remain stolen. Families were disrupted as a result of colonialism. In a place such as Australia, where children were forcefully taken from their families as part of the civilization movement, the intergenerational hauntings that continue to linger, and of course the overall physical and mental trauma that we still have to contend with. It is the holistic and intersectional understanding of suffering that is required for us to truly imagine the possibility for a psychology that contributes truly towards healing. So I look at the gendered experiences in communities, gendered experiences, but also issues of social justice and the role that psychology can play and contribute towards a socially just society. So while I engage with gender and women's place in society, how they continue to be peripheralized and treated as subhuman, I'm also interested in what trauma looks like in the everyday experiences of people. How does trauma travel with people in their bodies, in their interrelationships, and in their intimate experiences and spaces as well? I'm also interested in the relationship between historical trauma and trauma as experienced in the now. It continues. And how are these to be understood in relation to one another? How do we put the past and the present alongside each other? I try to think critically about how we engage with the possibility of healing from trauma and why we need to understand how trauma manifests, how it is a collective experience, and how it is political, historical, and manifest also in economic issues. Who's got access to resources? And what are the implications of being able to move freely in the world? 
How can our understanding of trauma from these multi-dimensions enable us to understand the way in which it travels and maps itself in our bodies and specifically in the lives of women? How may we theorize multiple forms of trauma, perpetual woundedness from the community level, from the collective, from the stories of our community members? and from an African and Aboriginal worldviews and perspectives. I came to the realization of the need to challenge and problematize what it means to produce knowledge and the ways in which it gets disseminated. With this realization, I shifted my focus to look at the ways in which the work that I do could serve the decolonization agenda. So what, that might, what might that look like? There is a need to disrupt hegemonic knowledges by inserting ourselves in ways that serve us. This position enables us to be anti-Eurocentric without being anti-European. Right? While appreciating the contributions made by European theories, we know they are insufficient and oftentimes not even relevant to some of our cosmologies and worldviews. So we need to critique the ways in which these theories have subordinated other epistemologies. African worldview is premised on the idea that personhood, being human, can be understood only in relation to other people. The colonial project thrived because of the categorization of human beings where black women in particular were relegated to the bottom of humanity. However, it is crucial to note that black women's suffering is directly linked to the suffering of both black men and children. Understanding first and foremost this position of how suffering manifests will assist us to grapple with how we can respond to societal challenges such as gendered trauma. For example, the problem of femicide in a country like South Africa where it's a huge challenge, of domestic violence, and so on, can be read via the lens of historical trauma. So we do not and should not only look at the symptoms of what's happening in front of us, but also understand the root of what it is that we're experiencing in the now. So as we continue to theorize and attempt to make meaning of our individual contexts, either back home in South Africa or here in Australia, it is critical to do so with what Thomas Teo calls epistemic modesty. And here a decolonial lens becomes useful. Taking a decolonial standpoint allows for the acknowledgement of multiplicity of knowledges and theorizing, which calls for humility, and embracing the possibility and legitimacy of indigenous knowledges and wisdoms. Thomas Teo warns that the critique of colonial psychology, where the call is to adopt a decolonial approach, and the support for indigenous psychologies requires going beyond decolonization as a metaphor. This slogan that we use, what does it fundamentally mean for us to decolonize. We need to understand these as part of a struggle for intellectual and social justice. In a country like South Africa, a move toward decolonization means centering African-centered ways of being and knowing. The move towards Africanization would require us to embark on the journey of relearning. Relearning means moving away from the colonialism or how colonialism and Eurocentric education has made us strangers to ourselves. We need to acknowledge that we have always been people with identities, with a sense of belonging, and who have rich histories that have been intentionally erased by colonialism. African cosmologies and ways of being in the world 
continue to be absent in many of our classrooms, many of our lecture halls. So the process of relearning means getting to know ourselves again. When we speak about Ubuntu, we need to ask what does it fundamentally mean in terms of people connecting with one another? The idea or, or, or this notion of Ubuntu is, is often thrown around and just used without uh, respect or deep understanding of the meaning of what, of, of what it is. Um, many companies even have it as one of their payoff lines, you know. Ubuntu, uh, the Batupili principle, putting people first. But the actual understanding of what the philosophy is and what it stands for uh, is not embedded in the actual practices that are there. And that makes me quite upset, actually, um, because it's very disrespectful. What does healing mean in an African framing of wellness? Again, KJ, our, our conversation just now before the lecture when we were talking about traditional healing systems. <laughs> what does healing mean? Right? What does being well mean uh, from this standpoint? The principles of Ubuntu are in line with the notion of an ecocentric self, which McCormick speaks about in his work focusing on Aboriginal approaches to counseling. McCormick argues that an ecocentric self, in which the person is strongly connected to the environment and natural forces, is a common tenet of many Aboriginal cultures. The connections with the land and environment provide many sources for the sustenance of First Nations people. As sources of emotional regulation, guidance and soothing. Here, well-being is described in terms of the balance of physical, cultural, emotional and spiritual elements. In her book, Reweaving of the Soul of the Nation, African scholar and healer Matsilo Mozei highlights the importance of indigenous knowledge systems and their potential to assist us to respond to some of the societal challenges confronting us. Mozei argues that the shift would need to start with the self, looking inward, because how we relate to ourselves is an expression of how we will relate to other people and the environment. They always say, hurt people hurt others. The outward looking and focus on marketization, look at our universities, on profit, on private ownership, has contributed towards our disconnect with nature and the environment. Nature conservation, for example, is an integral part of indigenous knowledge systems. Think of the idea of totems as used by many African cultures, and I believe Aboriginal people as well. To solidify their interconnectedness with nature and the environment, I am of the monkey people. My totem uh, is the monkey Kimotsweni. If one's totem is a crocodile, then one will know not to pollute water. When one's totem is like mine, the monkey or the baboon, one will know the importance of conserving trees and not cutting them indiscriminately. Learning about ourselves and our relationship with others is incorporated in our cultural practices, such as these family totems and what these totems mean in our everyday encounters. All these carry opportunities for learning and exchange of knowledge from one generation to another. This is the kind of knowledge that you're not going to find um, in many of our classrooms. 
Capitalism has meant a skewed focus on commercial gain at the expense of the wellness of the environment. And then we're all excited and have catchy phrase about uh, climate change and about protecting the environment and about recycling. Um, where actually in many of our cosmologies, this is an integral part of who we are. We've destroyed so much that now we need to have recycling bins because of what we've done to the environment. The disconnect with the environment contributes towards the disconnect with ourselves. With indigenous knowledge, there is an understanding that taking care of the land is an ethical issue. It is this knowledge that continues to be peripheralized within many academic spaces. Taking indigenous knowledge seriously carries the potential to assist us to move towards reshaping the current knowledge ecosystem. Such a move would be feeding into the decolonization agenda. This project of unlearning and relearning is at the center of the decolonial project. Decolonization is about understanding that we are on this journey of rediscovery, and this journey is also at the same time the journey of healing. The journey of psychic healing generational healing, the journey of acknowledging the trauma we have experienced over generations. It is acknowledging that part of the healing process involves getting to know ourselves again, to bring back the balance I've just referred to. The project is not an individual project, it is a collective endeavor. It is multidimensional work that requires the contribution of all of us. It requires, in the case of my home discipline, psychology, to challenge itself, to critique its problematic history, and embark in the process of remaking and redefining itself, to critique this history. It is with all that I've said up to this point that I draw from visual methodologies to try and think about some of the ways in which we can do this work. So depending on where you are, um, what your focus in, thinking about what are the ways in which we can think about alternative diagnostics? What are some of the ways in which we can challenge the master narratives? The ways in which we can reclaim the erased or distorted history? So I use the visual arts as a way to reimagine how we grapple with notions of trauma and gendered suffering. And I'll briefly then illustrate how I employ visual methods uh, in my work. Part of what I've been doing over the years and I've been thinking about um, is how we can critically and creatively engage issues of trauma. How can we think about possible platforms and ways in which people can reflect, remember, and as Kenyan scholar Ngugi Wathiongo argues, remember fractured parts of ourselves, and in turn engage with what it means to be a black person, and in a context such as South Africa, or a context such as Australia places with histories of intense racial discrimination and where black people were and continue in many ways to be seen as subhuman. I was further interested in how racial discrimination existed alongside gender discrimination and how all these are critical in our sense of belonging and non-belonging. Can one truly feel like they belong within spaces where they are forever relegated to the periphery? Part of me contemplating on these questions and meditations and issues meant seriously engaging own disciplinary framing and the methodologies that we work with. We rely mostly on, on, on speaking on interviewing, on using questionnaires. Not that there's nothing wrong with those. 
um, but I find that they, they are insufficient in assisting me to do the kind of work that I do. The work of really delving into and engaging the work of memory and trauma at a social level and engaging with and problematizing how suffering manifests within society and not only within the, the individual, as often the case within psychology. So when I started, therefore, with this work, I was interested in the ways in which apartheid specifically shaped communities. You go to South Africa today, 2023, you, you still visibly see what apartheid did spatially to the people, to our psyches. You, you still see that. So it shaped communities in many ways. The lives of black people within these communities as a result of family disintegration, as a result of the dispossession, as a result of being taken away from your ancestral land. Sometimes when we want to do ceremonies, it's a struggle because we don't know where some of our parents, great-grandparents are buried. Some of those spaces are private, so you run the risk of being shot by some farmer if you have to go to that place. So these continue to be marked. And, and for us to be able to move forward, it's important for us to look back and do the work now. The narratives of trauma that many black people, many black women experienced, appeared to me to be muted in many spaces and platforms. I took a bit of time to look also at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and again there, how women's experiences and voices were muted. I was interested in engaging the ways in which apartheid was an integral part of the everyday, how it defined people's everyday, how it entered our homes, our intimate spaces, our bedrooms, our family sacred spaces. So truly, how can our ancestors rest in peace when many of our sacred spaces were disrespected. To engage and put a spotlight on these experiences using methodological tools, such as interviews, seemed limited to me. Anne Rogers, in her book, The Hidden Language of Trauma, highlights the need to find other modes of languaging trauma as a way to create space and give voice to the unsayable. So how do we engage and capture these unsayable traumatic experiences in a way that attends to their fullness? How do we talk about unsayable things, the stigmas linked and connected to the kinds of experiences that people have gone through? With these questions in mind, I started thinking about what is there in our communities that women already do and already know, what wisdoms lie in our communities that we could tap into, that we can use to tell the unsayable and reveal the hidden transcripts. And this is how I came to using embroidery as an alternative diagnostic. I looked at ways in which we could use embroidery to tell stories, to communicate the ways in which the personal is also political, and to use embroidery as a tool that women could draw from to visibilize the oppressive historical and present experiences that they encounter. The plan was to reimagine needle and textile work as more than just feminine and decorative forms of expression, as often many of the creations and, and artistic forms um, of indigenous people are, are, are looked at and perceived, right? The idea was to challenge the divide between the beautiful, the provocative, 
and the political way to highlight how art forms such as embroidery could also be used as a form of resistance and of challenging the oppressive systems and challenging the master narratives. So I thought of ways in which we could use the visual art form to tell hidden stories of gender trauma and in which we could use, sorry, and in particular, how apartheid affected and continues to affect women's lives. And so I embarked on a project that looked at women's experiences of growing up during apartheid, focusing on women's life stories and shaped and how these are shaped and influenced by apartheid and the meaning of reflecting back to this past and the implications of this past to the present. What the embroideries allowed us to do as a collective in the community is that it was not a time-specific project. One hour, two hours, transcribe. It was a long-term project that went on for months and allowed all of us to connect communally over a period of time. While working on the embroideries, focusing on individual stories, we also shared collective stories. The making of embroideries also created an opportunity and opened up space where many of the women could share hidden narratives with family members, not just with each other. Because untold stories lead to silences being passed on from one generation to the next. Often parents craft official scripts of what stories to share. But what about that which remains untold? In her extensive work on the Japanese internment, Nagata looked at how silences carried by the parents continued to haunt the children as well. And this is where the challenge of intergenerational trauma becomes manifest. The embroidery project aimed at telling and unveiling these hidden narratives. The project was about remembering, about healing, about allowing a platform and a space to express some of the experiences that black women went through that they never got the opportunity to express or that they struggled to articulate in words. Visual methodologies such as embroideries, I argue, show the power of the work of art towards psychological healing. Beyond women sharing their embroideries with each other, the work can be displayed and exhibited in ways that allows others to engage with the artworks and allow for continuous and multiple interpretations of the work. Furthermore, as art forms, the personally narrated embroideries are able to travel from one context to another. With these embroideries, narratives of pain, loss, grief, trauma can be artistically carved on cloth, which serves as a canvas that points to survival amidst devastation. So I offer embroidery as a tool and a research methodology that people in communities can relate to as it is an art and mode of communication that many people embedded within communities can understand. Because who are we doing the work for? So as creative methodology and mode of knowledge production, embroidery refuses to be bounded by disciplinary rules. By drawing on such methodologies, we can aesthetically, visually, and creatively tell stories about trauma, and about systemic injustices that would otherwise not be easy to talk about or to even make connections as we think about it. If we engage psychological healing with what we already know, with tools we have at our disposal, showing how people are an integral part to producing knowledge, allowing for multiple and collective owning of the narrative of healing, and keeping in mind the physical labor of embroidery and putting the past and present in the same canvas as a way to understand lived realities, we move closer to realizing a decolonized reality. So using tactile 
visual images such as embroideries to tell a story is an intriguing form of cross-referencing of art with narration and at the same time opening up further spaces for cross-referencing between other art forms and enabling women who survived substantial assaults and brutality against their material, social and cultural bodies to reclaim their identity and their sense of agency. And at the same time, reconstruct discontinuous subjectivities and repositioning themselves. The use of the visual image is a useful tool that can be used to tell people stories of liberation, of oppression, of survival. Can be used to mediate reality in a performative way and allow for collective emotional response as we work as a collective. It enables women who survived brutality as a result of oppressive regimes to rename and tell their stories in their own way. By taking seriously and paying attention to gender as a unit of analysis in our theorizing, as I move towards closing, we might move a step closer to an understanding of the dynamics and complexities of gender politics in our everyday lives. And with this in mind, I think of the ways in which to take my work forward. And so I continue with the work on embroidery in thinking about and responding to various injustices that confront us in society. And I've shifted to thinking about the everydayness of gendered violence more broadly. And I do this always acknowledging the impact of colonialism in the complex relationships and entanglements that people have in their everyday experiences. My focus is looking at what can be achieved when women reflect together. What can we achieve if we draw from the power of the collective? South African black women have for a long time believed in the power of the collective. Their belief in solidarity and collective resistance has always been one of their strategies for survival. One just needs to look at the 1956 march, how women organized themselves. One of the women was sharing the story of how her mother was one of those women who were there in 1956. How women who were working for white people as domestic workers across the country managed to organize over a period of time when they would clean and go and sit in the corners around and sit on the lawn with the little white kids on their backs and actually sending messages to each other that way. And as a result of that, more than 20,000 women gathered on one day to go and challenge the state and resist having to carry the past laws in a country of their ancestors. The solidarity is not in isolation, but in recognition of their coexistence with men all the time. This recognition assisted in fighting the apartheid regime, where women understood that their freedom was interwoven with that of their male counterparts. I continue to work with a collective of women in one of the communities in the Gauteng province in South Africa, the Indutuko uh, Collective. We came together to collectively engage the ways in which we could creatively make meaning of gender-based violence in our communities as it shows itself and manifests itself today. Our aim was to create a space where we could together imagine ways in which challenges faced by communities because of gendered violence could be given attention. The project followed participatory action research where we worked collaboratively with the women to produce knowledge through the making of embroideries. Working collaboratively, 
affords what Moya calls epistemic privilege. The notion of epistemic privilege for black women is only possible when they collectively acknowledge their shared and similar experiences. Methodologically, we aimed to practically show how visual methodologies and approaches could be sources of knowledge based on skills that communities already have. The intended outcome faced by communities the intended outcome was to show the possibility embroidery holds in assisting us to paint a picture of gender-based violence challenges faced by communities and visually depict ways in which meaning is made around experiences, around perceptions, and challenges related to gendered violence. In the spirit of centering indigenous knowledge systems in our work, I draw from the Maori notion of kaupapa, which privileges, as uh, Linda Tuhiwai Smith argues, privileges the principles of collective philosophy and acknowledging communities' aspirations, their ideals, and their hopes. So kaupapa for me is in line with the African notion of Ubuntu which speaks to how a person is who they are through other people, that our well-being is interlinked with that of others. So drawing from these indigenous philosophies, it makes sense, therefore, to approach my research process from a participatory perspective. We need to rethink the ways in which we work together with communities. We need to create spaces where our community research collaborators have a more visible and bigger stake in the kinds of projects that happen within their spaces, within their communities. We need to think of ways and possibilities of having research projects that get developed alongside or with community members. We conduct research in communities that still carry the scars of colonial exploitation and that continue to suffer from structural inequities and lack of access to valuable resources. However, that does not mean that these communities are vulnerable or they do not have a voice. It should not be understood that the lack of valuable resources, which is often intentional, is equivalent to people not having autonomy agency and therefore be rendered as vulnerable. We need to acknowledge this, be humble and conduct our work in ways that respect the humanity and dignity of people. In her book, uh, feminist South African scholar Pumla Gola, her book, A South African Nightmare, Rape, A South African Nightmare, she introduces us to the concept of the female fear factory. Here, Gola argues that we live in a society where fear is manufactured, is created, and produced by patriarchal and unjust structural violence systems. So it's not in the home or it's not in the partner that is violent that, you know, he beats his partner. While that is an issue, that is part of a microcosm of a bigger structure. It's critical to look at the unjust structural violence system that actually produce such subjects. The high rates of gendered violence which are perpetrated against women means they cannot feel safe within and outside their homes. Their bodies are regulated and controlled. In other words, they do not entirely own their bodies. Gender-based violence thrives because of the lack of support and safe spaces for those who are violated to share their experiences. Some choose to keep silent because of the shame, further victimization, fear and threats that should they speak, they will be in more danger. So it is only through ensuring that accountability takes place that justice can be realized. It is when the judiciary system, which is often 
a problem in itself and sometimes leading to people not even seeing the point of going the judiciary system route because that very system is the one that is violent to our bodies. So accountability or real accountability becomes a challenge, right? So the systems themselves need to be challenged, critiqued, and, and, and um, hopefully reshaped. Because it's only through that the possibility of a safe world for those who suffer gendered violence becomes possible. So I shall pause by saying that we continue on a journey to fight for the humanity of all people and the right to exist in a world where the color of my skin or my very existence does not put me at a perpetual risk of unspeakable violations and even death. We need to collectively critique, challenge, and work collaboratively for social justice. We are communities under siege, constantly, and we need to demand justice and acknowledgement of all of us to be recognized as fully human, with our humanity being protected. And so I shall pause by echoing Eze, who asserts that to write, and I add, to speak, to perform, to draw, to make embroideries about the wrongs of society is to, stay, is to take steps towards writing them by drawing people's attention to them. Because silence should never be an option in the face of violations of human rights. Gallebo.